This FizCast will be analysing a complicated multi-loop circuit. The question that's being asked here is to find the current in one of the parts of this circuit. Let's begin by interpreting how our solution will proceed. In this particular circuit we have two voltage sources, a 20 volt and a 40 volt, and a reasonably complicated network of interconnected resistors. We can see that if we tried to use Ohm's law to determine the current that we're being asked for here, we'd need to be able to ascertain what the various currents were through the various resistors to find the potential difference at various locations. In this instance, this will prove to be far too difficult an operation. Instead, a better approach in this case will be via Kirchhoff's circuit laws, where we can think about the currents that must be at various nodes and the currents that must be around various loops. Now let's move to the develop stage of our solution. One thing that might be important is to identify what currents we're going to be analysing in this particular circuit. Remember that in any part of a circuit where there are no decision making points or nodes, the current must be the same in all parts. So if we, for the time being, label this particular point here C, and we consider going from A up to C through this 20 volt source, let's call that perhaps current I1. It doesn't really matter what direction we choose, although here I'm kind of guessing that maybe because this is the high potential side of the 20 volt source, a current might be going in that direction. So anywhere between A and C along this path, up through the 20 volt source, across through the 1 kilo ohm resistor, will be the same current. And I could say, maybe coming down from C to A along this direction, I might call that current I2. Again, I shouldn't spend too much time worrying about the direction. My calculations will determine whether, in fact, it is in that direction or not. I might also decide to label the current coming up in this part of the circuit through the 40 volt potential there, I3, and then I might choose the current coming down in this part of the circuit to be I4, and then the current that I'm actually being asked to calculate, the current between points A and B, I might choose to be in that direction, and I'll call that current I5. And now every part of my circuit has been labelled by the current that must be moving through that part of the circuit. And if I can find the relationships between those various currents, I should be able to calculate a value for I5. In the develop stage, I'll remember here that I can use the node law from Kirchhoff's laws, and that tells me that the sum of the currents at any particular node must equal zero, where I can choose the currents going into the node to be positive and the currents going out of the node to be negative. And in addition, um, for a loop, for any particular loop that I choose, the sum of the voltage changes around that loop must also sum to zero. And there's some rules that we remember about how you do that. Um, I've defined here three nodes, A, B, and C. I probably want to think about some loops that I might choose. So let's imagine we go around this triangular loop here. Let's call that loop number one. We could also go around this triangular loop here. Let's call that loop number two. And we could also choose to go around this loop here. Let's call that loop number three. There are other loops we could choose. One, for example, might be to go around the entire outside of the square of this circuit. But as we will see, I think we have enough equations just considering those three loops there. So let's move to our evaluation stage. In our evaluation stage, we need to construct these equations from Kirchhoff's laws. So let's begin with the loop law, and let's, just because it's at the top of the circuit, let's imagine what's the relationship between the currents that are coming into or out of node C. That particular point there, I1 is going in to node C, and let's see, I2 is coming out of that node, so I'll put minus I2. Um, I3 is also coming into that node, so that will be a positive contribution to the current at that node. And I4 is leaving, so that would be minus I4. And they're all of the currents that are involved at that node, so that sum of currents must equal zero. I could do a similar thing down here at node A, where, for example, I'd have current I1 will actually be leaving that node, so I could have minus I1. Uh, let's say I2 is entering that node, so that will be plus I2. 
and I5 is also entering that node, plus I5. And that's all the currents that are coming into or out of node A, so that must also equal zero. And finally, at node B, hopefully you can see there, we're going to have I3, I4, and I5 with the appropriate signs on there. I should have minus I3 plus I4 minus I5 will also equal zero. And they're my three node equations. Interestingly, as you'll always see, these three equations actually aren't independent. If I combine any two of these equations, I'll actually get the third. For example, if I were to add, uh, say, a, this top equation here to the next equation below, I actually end up with the third equation. So I really only have two distinct relationships in these three equations, and that's worth keeping in mind. What if I now think about the loops? Let's let's think about what relationships we get between uh, the various currents in these loops. And one thing I'm going to do as I do this calculation is if I write my uh, resistances in kilo ohms, and if I consider these currents to be in milliamps, then every time I do a current times a resistance, that will actually be in units of volts. So I'm going to be looking at potential drops around this circuit that involve a current times a resistance. And if I keep my values of resistance in kilo ohms and think of my current values in milliamps, then in fact the milli, the 10 to the minus 3 power in my current, will, calc will multiply by the 10 to the power of 3 for my kilo in ohms, giving me a quantity in volts. Which means if I think about my voltage sources in volts, I can think about my I times R in volts that way. And at the end I've got to remember that I've been calculating currents all the way through in milliamps, not in amps. So let's begin with loop number one. For loop number one here, let's perhaps begin at this voltage source. I'm going to be going from the low potential to the high potential side of my voltage source. So I'm going to pick up 20 volts there. And then I'm going to go through this one kilo ohm resistor in the same direction as I1. So that's a drop in potential there. That will be I1 times one. Then continuing around this loop, from point C I'm coming down to point A. Now I'm going through this 4 kilo ohm resistor in the direction of I2. So that will also be a negative, a drop in potential, which will be 4 times I2, because the resistor there is 4 kilo ohms. And then I return back to, to where I started at the, at the 20 volt potential source. So that sum of potentials must equal 0. I can do a similar thing here for loop 2. Uh, again, I might start at the 40 volt uh, potential here, but I'm going clockwise in this loop as well. It actually doesn't matter which direction I go as long as I'm consistent. So I'm going clockwise, I'm going from the high potential side of the 40 volt supply to the low, so I actually lose 40 volts there. Then I'm coming up through this 3 kilo ohm resistor in the opposite direction to I4, so I'll actually pick up 3 times I4, that will be a positive potential change there. Then coming through this 2 kilo ohm resistor here, again in the opposite direction to I3, so I will be having an increase in potential. I will gain 2 times I3 through that 2 kilo ohm resistor. And then once again I'm back where I started, and that must equal 0. And for loop 3 here, uh, going around here, there actually are no potential uh, sources in here. There's no EMF supplies, no batteries if you like. So all I'm going to have are currents uh, through resistors. And in fact you can see I5 has no voltage drop across here, which is kind of perhaps surprising, but we'll see what that turns out to mean in our calculation. So let's consider going up through this 4 kilo ohm resistor in the direction of our loop, which is clockwise here. So I'm going in the opposite direction to the current, so I'll get plus 4 lots of I2 as my um, increase in potential, and then I'm going through this loop down through the 3 kilo ohm resistor in the same direction as the current, so that will be minus 3 times I4, and then I'm actually back to the start of my loop because nothing happens between A and B, there are no potential drops across there, so that must equal 0. And I could again, as I mentioned, find some other loops in this particular circuit, but there are clearly five things in this circuit, I don't know, five values for these currents, I1, I2, I3, I4, and I5, that I don't know. So strictly speaking, I would need five independent equations here to be able to mathematically identify the values for each of those. 
and I mentioned that these node equations here actually only give me two independent equations. So I've got three nodes, but that really only gives me two equations that I can use. But my loop equations here will each be independent. So there's three equations there plus the two node equations that I can use. And all up, that gives me five equations that I need to know to find the five things that I don't know. I1 all the way through to I5. Of course, the questions only ask me for one of those, but I need to be able to solve in principle for all of them to find any one of them. So in a sense, this is kind of the solution to the problem. And you might have your own preferred method for solving simultaneous equations. We have five equations here that must all be simultaneously true. We want to find the values for I1 through to I5 that make these equations true at all times. And there's lots of ways to do it. If you wanted to stop the FizCast now and think about how you'd solve these, that's fine. The, the rest of the FizCast is going to step through a reasonably brute force approach to solving these equations, just in case you have no idea how to even begin this. But if the solving of the equations is something that you're kind of comfortable with, then maybe fast forward through. We'll do a little bit of an assess step at the end, of course, but you might not bother watching what's going to be a reasonably drawn out step-by-step um, -step solution to these five simultaneous equations. But if that's something that would be of use to you, then, uh, then keep watching and we will think now what's the, the mathematical procedure we might use here to come up with a solution for these currents. Uh, one thing to identify is that we're looking for I5 so really we just want to keep eliminating currents out of these, out of these, um, these equations until all that we're left with is I5. So I'm using kind of an elimination or substitution method. I'm not entirely sure what the mathematicians would insist that I call it. But if we can identify on each of these equations what they contain. So for example, this one here, the, the, the second of our node equations, it contains I1, I2, and I5. This next node equation has I3, I4, and I5. This first loop equation here has just I1 and I2. This next loop equation has I4 and I3. And this next loop equation here has I2 and I4. So we want to get I5 by itself. It's actually only in these two equations here with I1, I2, I3, and I4. And these loop equations nicely in this situation actually only have pairs of currents. So it might be possible to start eliminating some of these things so we can get I5 by itself. And uh, it might be useful in this case to actually label our equations. Let's call this equation 1, let's call this equation 2, let's call this equation 3, etc, etc. There are our five equations we've got. And one of my first steps that I might do here is I might think about combining equations 4 and 5, both of which have I4 in them, and try to eliminate I4. End up with an equation that's only in I2 and I3. And one reason that's kind of nice to do is I can see one of those equations has three lots of I4 and the other one has minus three lots of I4. So if I simply took those two equations and I did equation 4 plus equation 5, then what will I have there? I will have minus 40. There is no constant value in this other equation, so I've just got minus 40 as my constant term there. And I'll end up with um, 2I2 sorry, 4i2 from that equation, so there's my plus 4i2. My 3i4 minus my 3i4 will disappear, and then I'll end up with just plus 2i3. And of course, if I add the zeros on the right-hand side of those two equations, I'll also get a zero. So I've just simply added those two equations, the left-hand sides, and added the right-hand sides, which is kind of easy with zeros in there. And I can see immediately, I can actually simplify this equation if I divide through by 2, everything that has a common factor of 2. So I could have minus 20 plus 2i2 plus i3 equals 0. And so now I have an equation that simply has i2 and i3 in it. The next step I might choose to do might be to look at equations 3 and equation 1. And the nice thing I can do with equations 3 and equation 1 is I could perhaps eliminate I1. And so I'd have I2 and I5 left in those two equations. So what's a good combination to do there? Well, so I can see if I look at equation 3 here, I have uh, f minus I1 
and in equation 1 I have also have minus I1. So if I took the difference of those two equations, say I took equation 3 minus equation 1, what will I have if I do that? Well, I'll end up with a constant there of 20, because there is no constant uh, in equation 1, so it's just the, the constant coming from equation 3, and I'll have minus 5I2 minus I5 equals 0. And now I have an equation, as I said, just with I2 and I5 in it. Now, I'm actually going to just now write some equations rather than going step by step in quite the process I've been doing now. I think you will be getting the feel for the kind of steps I'm taking. And so I'll actually be not narrating every step I take now, but you still should be able to look at the equations we have above and think about how they're being combined. So now I've got I2, I3, I2 and I5. I could in principle now combine these two and just get an equation but it's I3 and I5. In fact, that's the next step that I'm going to do. So here the next step I've taken is to think about how to combine these to remove I2. One of them had 2I2, one of them had minus 5I2. If I multiply one of those equations by 5 and the other one by 2, then I can actually just add these two equations and I'll remove that I2 term just there. So this is the equation I end up with. And as I was looking for, I now only have I3 and I5 in this equation. If I could find another equation with only I3 and I5 in it, then I could combine those two to get I5 by itself and, and find the quantity that I'm looking for. So if I look, how can I get another equation that only has I3 and I5? If I combine equations 2 up here with equation 4, and I eliminate I4 from those two equations, I'll have an equation that just has I3 and I5 in it. So that's what I'll set up to do now. So I realized that to make the I4 cancel for those two equations, I actually need to do three times equation 2 and subtract off equation 4. And that removed I4 from the relationship when I did that combination. And this is the combination I have now. Again, only involving now I3 and I5. And now I should be able to combine this relationship with the one I had previously, over here on the right-hand side, and remove I3 from those two and simply have a relationship with I5. And so now I've taken those two equations that are just containing I3 and I5, and it turns out that if I just add them, you can see the I3 terms cancel, and this is what I'm left with, which I can rearrange really quite easily to show that I5 in this case here is going to be minus 4. And remember we were calculating our currents in milliamps, so I5 has a value of minus 4 milliamps. Now let's think for a second what that's actually telling us. We'll move our screen down a bit. It's telling us the current here that we're being asked for in this problem between A and B is 4 milliamps. That's what we just calculated. But it said minus 4 milliamps because in fact I got the direction incorrect. A current going from B to A, as I've indicated here, of minus 4 milliamps is actually a current that goes from A to B of plus 4 milliamps. The current direction for I5 is actually from A to B of 4 milliamps. I'm not going to change the direction on my diagram because my calculation has been based on that direction and I know the value of I5 as indicated on the diagram is minus 4 milliamps. In other words it's going in the opposite direction. And of course we should be doing an assess uh, stage in this solution as well. What do we need to do to assess? Well, strictly speaking, we should use our value for I5, and we should go back and use our various relationships to calculate values for I4, I3, etc., etc. And in doing so, we can then come back to our, our circuit and see, for example, a loop that we didn't use in our calculation, perhaps this rectangular loop, going all the way around the outside of this circuit here and see if indeed we apply the loop rule to that does it give us the correct answer and I'll leave it as an exercise for you to go back through and see how you would calculate I4, I3, I2 and I1 it should be fairly straightforward and then to make sure that in fact those values that you get do satisfy all of these node law and loop law equations <laughs>